so welcome everyone and good evening um, welcome to the fourth uh, session of the three day virtual conference organized by bengali academy for social empowerment in collaboration with uh, dr b r ambedkar college and the ambedkar center for social studies of um, gaur mahavidyalaya malda uh, now that we have come to the very last session of the day uh, we don't have much to say um, at the uh, in the beginning so without uh, further ado i would like to um, inter, uh, request professor nargis ahmed madam uh, assistant professor department of Nar um, nursing alia university to formally introduce our chair for the session dr pinky isha ma'am nargis ma'am are you there uh, yes jaida thank yes, you so much so thank you thank okay, you thank you um once again good evening everybody present here uh, in our second day program of three days virtual conference this is the session 4 our last session of the day for presentation Uh, to chair this session, it is my proud privilege uh, to welcome and introduce Dr. Pinky Isha, Assistant Professor of Department of English, uh, Ravindra Bharati University. Madam's area of interest is new literatures in English, modern and postmodern British drama, performance studies, etc. So, uh, without further delay, I heartily welcome Dr. Pinky Isha. to chair the this session so madam this session is over to you now thank you thank you so much for the organizing uh, for organizing such a beautiful seminar even amidst the pandemic thank you the base organizers for you know taking the trouble to coordinate so many members together and bring them onto a common platform which is very difficult throughout the day i must give my special thanks to zahira and others who have been working round the clock for this thank you so much uh without further ado as uh, the convener say we begin right away with the session thank you once again hello hello yes ma'am you are audible yes Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. You are audible, ma'am. I think uh, the schedule. I have uh, shared the schedule with you, so I think that can be helpful. Or do you want me to call out the names and uh, uh, you know? No, just before they speak, just uh, uh, calling out the names once of the paper presenters would be. Yeah. Okay. So I shall be doing it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. um so we have for this session um dr s uh, sujarita and uh, then we have uh, amrita mitra and after amrita mitra we have uh, uh, dinesh kumar um and then we have uh, somi mansoor and after that we have ikra mansoor so i hope all of you are present here uh, the first uh, presentation is by Uh, Dr. Sujarita, Assistant Professor of English, Pondicherry University Community College, Pondicherry. Madam, are you here? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, the title of her paper is "The Problematics of Belonging and Rootlessness: A Study of Select Diaspora Fictions." Now, yeah, this is over to you, ma'am. Good evening to one and all. Thank you for this opportunity. the title of my paper as um, mom just mentioned the problematic of ruthlessness and belonging in select diaspora fictions but here i am focusing only on jai kogawa's obasan uh, due to time constraint in the global era let me move to the paper in the global era movement of human is a wound humans new move from their home country or town for various reasons based on the reasons for movement different terms like exile expatriate diaspora and immigrant are being used exile happens due to forceful migration from the home country whereas in the case of other movements it can be either forced or voluntary but vary in its characteristics uh, diaspora communities actually they differ from other types of movements with regard to the emotional attachment with the home country though they live as a citizen of the settled land they can they carry the land they left as their homeland for many generations thus the diaspora community shares an emotional attachment with the homeland moreover they try to maintain their ethnic religious and cultural identities in the new land with a desire to return home in the future 
people belonging to the condition of diaspora most often are oscillating between the land that they inhabit and the land that they have foregone. As a result of this, they, they live in a constant state of ruthlessness and continuously strive to return to their home countries. This kind of situation, problematic of belonging and ruthlessness, has been put down as a sense of doubleness filled with nostalgia, filial piety, and cruelty. Diasporic literature is an offshoot of the diasporas who have access to education and literacy. It characteristically focuses on discrimination, nostalgia, identity, and a sense of belonging. Moreover, it emphasizes on the writings of and by the diaspora community wherein writers convey their ambivalent position and their oscillating condition between the homeland and the settled land. Many of the works discuss the individual or community's attachment to the homeland and the urge to belong in the settled land that results in their hybrid existence. The main issues experienced by the diaspora community, in particular by the first generation diaspora people, is a feeling of nostalgia, that is belong, the feeling of belonging to the home country and dislocation, a kind sense of rootlessness in the settled land. Diaspora writing mostly becomes a response to the lost homes and to issues such as dislocation, nostalgia, discrimination and identity. Almost all the diaspora works deals at least with one of these issues. Dislocation is one of the first feelings that haunt a diaspora community. As mentioned earlier, dislocation happens due to two reasons, maybe voluntary or non-voluntary. Uh, when the people settle in the new land, they try to escape from the reality of life in the settled land through nostalgia. Feeling of loneliness and alienation in the new country prevent the first generation diaspora community from dingling, mingling with the others in the settled society. Even when they attempt to blend, most of the time it becomes problematic as they find that they are being discriminated. Diaspora people find complexity in getting out of the feeling of alienation, loneliness and loss which leads to the issue of ruthlessness. Facing external problems like discrimination and identity crisis is easier for them than facing their inner problems like loneliness and alienation as it causes more suffering. The present paper analyzes Jai Kogawa's Obasan with the idea of rootlessness and belonging. Jai Kogawa is a Japanese Canadian writer who was born at Vancouver, British Columbia in 1935. During the First Second World War, the Canadian government shifted the Japanese Canadians to internment camps and confiscated their properties. Consequently, Kogawa and her family members were forced to move to different parts of Canada and faced several difficulties. Obasan is a semi-autobiographical novel written by Kogawa based on the injustice faced by the Japanese Canadians during and after World War II. The novel's plot is narrated through Naomi, the protagonist, Nomi, through her family history, explains the trials and tribulations of the Japanese Canadians during the Second World War. Nomi's family was fragmented due to the discrimination of the Canadian government. Nomi, along with her brother, was left with the, left the other family members. The novel focuses on the issue of rootlessness and identity of the Japanese diaspora community in Canada. The diaspora community initially try to adjust with a new culture and society into which they have moved. However, they are not willing to follow the new land's culture completely. In spite of living for a longer period in the settled land, they still consider it as another country. This feel of rootlessness becomes stronger when they face discrimination in the settled land. Discrimination may happen due to various reasons. The settled country may feel offended by the oscillating condition of the diaspora community and it may create threat to its own culture. So it may try to show its discrimination. And uh, there are several reasons for discriminations like uh, based on culture, nation and religion, diaspora communities are being discriminated. Unfriendly relationship with the country may lead the settled land to exhibit its anger on immigrants from that particular country or community. This results in feel or fear of rootlessness for migrants. In Obasan, the Japanese Canadian diaspora community, in spite of living for many years as citizens of Canada, were discriminated after the Pearl Harbor incident. Before the incident, the Japanese Canadians, they lived a very comfortable life in Canada. But later, the attitude of the Canadian government changed the life of the Japanese Canadian people. 
they were looked with suspicious eye by the Canadians and it considered all the Japanese Canadians as spies of Japan. Hence, the Canadians decided to erase the Japanese com community from Canada. The rejection, of the, re the rejection by the Canadian government caused much pain to the Japanese Canadian. And um, it is stated in the book, I quote from the text, one reporter points to those among us who are living in poverty and says, no British subject would live in such condition. Then if we improve our lot, another say there is danger that they will enter our better neighborhood. If we are educated, the complaint is that we will cease being the ideal servant. It makes me choke. The diseases, the crippling, the twi twistling of our souls is still to come, end quote. The Japanese Canadians were forced to leave their home and property, which were later confiscated by the Canadians, as I mentioned earlier. The family members were forced to relocate themselves in abandoned towns or in mining settlements and forced to do difficult jobs. Such experiences resulted in confusion of identity among the second generation of the diaspora community. Much later, even in her adulthood, the protagonist Naomi felt uncomfortable to think about the past. She states, I quote, I'm tired, I suppose, because I want to get away from all this, from the past and all these papers, from the present, from the memories, from the death, from Aunt Emily and her heaps of words. I want to break loose into the heavy identity the evidence of rejection, the unexpressed passion, the misunderstood politeness. I'm tired of living between deaths and funerals, unable to shout or sing or dance, unable to scream, unable to laugh, unable to breathe out loud, end quote. It, it, makes us it enables us to understand the pain of the second generation diaspora community. Aunt Emily's diaries were sh short historical accounts of the discriminations experienced by the Japanese Canadians. Emily's narration discloses the buried historical and political fates of Japanese Canadians. The discrimination faced by the community stand as a permanent wound in their heart. Naomi st states, I quote, the tension everywhere was not clear to me and then, and it is not much clearer today. Time has solved many few mysteries. Wars and rumors of wars, racial hatred and fears are still with us. It proves that the Japanese Canadians lived with a sense of rootlessness and in the condition of Trishangu. In the case of discrimination, the first and second generation of diaspora community have different reactions. The first generation accepts it as a normal way, though it was painful, but for the second and further generations who believe the land as their home country are affected psychologically. Therefore, they face discrimination. It hurts them and raises questions regarding their belonging. Moreover, it makes them to be separated from the settled society and it raises predicament with regard to identity. Consequently, the second and later generation of the diaspora community display a dual identity. In Obasan, when the Canadian government showed its discrimination against Japanese, it affected the Japanese Canadians psychologically. They who belong to the second and third generation suffer more than the first generation people. As they are born and brought up in Canada, they consider it as their home country. When their own people discriminate them, they were unable to understand it. Stephen or Naomi, though who are the second and third generation of uh, uh, diaspora community, could not understand the real situation and their condition when they were young. Their friends, without any reason, changed as their enemies. For Stephen, their condition was like a riddle. He states, we are both the enemy and not the enemy. At school, Stephen and Nomi suffer because of racism. Once in school, a girl said to Stephen, I quote, all the Jap kids at school are going to be sent away as they are bad and you are a Jap, unquote. Therefore, most of the second generations, and it affects them psychologically, which has resulted in their um, adolescence also, where they began to search for their place of belonging. From the above given analysis, it is clear that the problematic of rootlessness is unavoidable for the first generation diaspora community as they leave their roots in the home country and they try to pass their life with nostalgic feeling of their home country. In the case of second and further generation of the diaspora community, their plight of belonging is inevitable as they, as they consider the nation in which they are born as their home country, 
but their appearance in most of the cases and cultural practices that is apart from what they follow from their parents homeland project them as different the study indicates that the problem of rootlessness and and, and belonging are unavoidable in diaspora literature thank you Hello. Can uh, everybody hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am. You are audible. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Shujarita, uh, for that wonderful presentation. I I do have a few questions, but we would take up questions at the end. In fact, I don't have questions. I have a few observations, but we can uh, go on to the next paper if uh, that is okay. Uh, yes, uh, sure. I think uh, the next paper is by uh, Amrita Mitra, Assistant Professor of English, Banwari Lal Bhalutia College, Asansol. Uh, Amrita, ma'am, are you there? Yes. Okay, so this is over to you, ma'am. Should I begin to read my paper? Yeah, sure. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'm Amrita Mitro. I am an assistant professor at Banwari Lal Bhalotia College, Asansol. And the title of my paper is To Belong or Not to Belong, a study of diasporic experiences in Jhumpa Lahiri's select short stories. Let's start by quoting a few lines from the poem Land by Aga Shahid Ali. If home is found on both sides of the globe, home is of course here and always a mist land. Home is where the heart is, which is perhaps too true for migrants worldwide. There always remains the yearning for one's homeland, the intense desire to return to it, and at the same time, the nagging need to fit into the new socio-cultural milieu of the land that promises to fulfill your dreams and pave their way to prosperity. In such a state of dilemma, a state of simultaneous double allegiance to the home and host country, the migrant is caught between his then and now, and suffers the question as to why, after all this while, home is always there and never here. The complexity regarding the question of home has been addressed by Minakshi Thapan in introduction, making complete identity woman and the state. And I quote, people conceive their lives and identity in terms of movement, implying that one is co never completely breaking away from the past, home. Thus, the home itself may be experienced as in flux, Home has come to be conceptualized in fluid terms as being neither here nor there. Rather, itself a hybrid, it is both here and there, an amalgam, a pastiche, a performance. People living across nations have been through a multiple homes and in this journey of theirs, they seek to define and redefine their identities and sense of belonging. Sunil Bhatia says in Rethinking Culture and Identity in Psychology, that immigrants living in transnational diasporas are connected to dual societies and inhabit multiple homes, roles, identities, and languages. Their networks and belong ideas of belonging transcend national boundaries that bring together the local and the global and the home and the host culture into a single social field. Immigrants reinvent and reconstruct their identity as they move from the culture of their homeland to their new cultures. While migration is generally done with the dreams of better lives, the diasporic community always harbors in its heart the alienation it feels in relation to the host country. A migrant fails to be at home in his newly acquired, maybe even aspired, host home. Inhibiting a home away from home, he grows to rethink his identity and consequently forms a diasporic consciousness in everyday living. On the question of identity, he is involved after all this while in search of a stable, concrete entity for himself, which in reality is impossible to achieve. For he is surely not homeless, yet what he inhibits, he cannot think as home, although he has found security and success in his present host home. 
His diasporic identity must then be thought of as a production, which is never complete, always in process, according to Hall. In this context, we will also refer to what Stuart Hall in his famous essay says about cultural identity and the two ways it can be conceptualized. Firstly, as a sort of one true self, hiding inside the many other, more superficial or artificially imposed selves, which people with a shared history and ancestry held common. This identity refers to the common element in terms of historical experiences and shared cultural codes that has helped the diasporic community to behave as one, to think of themselves as a unified us. The other definition that Hall provides theorizes cultural identity as a matter of becoming as well as being. It belongs, and I quote over here, it belongs to the past as much as to the future as much as to the past. It is not something which already exists, transcending place, time, history, and culture. Cultural identities come from somewhere, have histories, but like everything which is historical, they undergo transformation. This fluidity associated with the ongoing process of the construction of identity and the experience of belonging slash homelessness has been crucial in understanding the psyche of diasporic communities as they face a shift in geographic and cultural space and struggle to accommodate themselves in an alien atmosphere and assimilate the other's terms and values in their system. There is a rupture in the cultural practices of both the immigrant and the dominant social spheres. However, even within the diasporic community itself with different generations, Cultural identities and the need and extent of assimilation and belonging has altered. Therefore, the diasporic community not only faces a crisis in assuming a stable, definable identity, but also that the upcoming generations born in the host home are faced with critical questions regarding home and belonging. Identity is a fluid entity and it becomes more mobile and complex when the host born second generation immigrants try to figure out the otherness associated with their ancestry, and how even though some things seem deceivingly simple and rightly irrelevant, there is something that haunts and comforts at the same time, the baggage slash treasure of cultural rubies from the land of their fathers. Diasporic writers too have spoken about the identity crisis that the migrant faces. Rushdi famously writes that it may be that writers in my position, exiles or immigrants or expatriates, are haunted by some sense of loss, some urge to reclaim, to look back even at the risks of being mutated into pillars of salt. But if we do look back, we must also do so, we must also do so in the knowledge which gives rise to profound uncertainties, that our physical alienation from India almost inevitably means that we will not be capable of reclaiming precisely the thing that was lost, that we will, in short, create fictions, not actual cities or villages, but invisible ones, imaginary homelands, India's of the mind. I will also refer uh, to what Chumpa Lahiri, who is herself a second generation immigrant, this is what she says in an interview. The question of identity is always a difficult one, but especially for those who are culturally displaced as immigrants are, or those who grow up in two worlds simultaneously as their children. The older I get, the more aware am I that I have somehow inherited the sense of exile from my parents, even though in many ways I am more American than they are. There is an acute sense of pain associated with the awareness of being different, non-belonging social other in her words. The first generation immigrant comes with the knowledge of leaving behind his or her home and accepts the new country as the host nation. But his children born in the host country face a strange dilemma as the host country has now become their home, their only home. In this context, I will also mention the studies of Sherry Phillip, who writes, the generation of Asian Americans that are called the second generation were born in the US, but have grown up with the perspectives of their parents. In addition to the socialization practices of their parents, second generation individuals are also shaped by their environment given their exposure and socialization in a post-civil rights political climate, the second generation directly confronts the dynamics of the racial thinking that predominates in American society. As a result, the issues that the second generation face are unique and worthy of careful study. She further writes that the second generation immigrant experiences are different from their parents because they become culture brokers for their parents. 
and they're able to pick up cues more quickly due to their daily interactions with ethically different peers. Therefore, the identification patterns between first-generation immigrants and their American-born children may be different because of their different levels of exposure to American society. I look forward to analyze this difference in experience based on the generation of the immigrant in the light of two stories from Chumpa Lahiri's cycle of stories and interpreter of maladies, stories of Boston, Bengal, and beyond. The stories that I will be referring to are Mrs. Sen and Mr. Pirzada comes to die. Mrs. Sen, referring to the first story, Mrs. Sen, the protagonist, a professor's wife, responsible and kind, and a first generation migrant, has agreed to look after Elliot. Elliot, who is a little boy, little American boy. Her difference in attire and attitude in relation to the earlier babysitters is spelled out clearly in the beginning. As the story progresses, we see her trying to adapt herself to the alien environment, but finally letting all of it get to her in the sudden car accident. As honest as her efforts were in trying to Americanize her life, she failed miserably in learning, in trying to learn to drive. Driving, something that she had not bothered to learn in India, was an indispensable activity in the US. She explains to Elliot's mother, and I quote over here, at home, you know, we have a driver. You mean a chauffeur? Mrs. Sen glanced at Mr. Sen, who nodded. Elliot's mother nodded too, looking around the no room. And that's all in India? Yes, Mrs. Sen replied. The mention of the word seemed to release something in her. She neatened the border of a sari where it rose diagonally across her chest. She too looked around the room, as if she noticed in the lampshades, in the teapot, in the shadows, frozen on the carpet, something the rest of them could not. Everything is there. The last phase sums up the existence of Mrs. Sen in America. All that she valued and nurtured were back in India. Everything is there, automatically echoes, and nothing is here, emptiness. She always seems to live an Indian life on American soil, be it the ritualistic chopping of vegetables with her blade that curved like the prow of a Viking ship, her obsession with whole fish, her longing for the letters from home, her cassettes of Indian music and familiar voices, her insistence on serving Elliot's mother daily as she came to pick up her boy, much like the tradition of hospitality, her sari, the flip-flops they wear at home, all are indicative of her present being but a poor imitation of her past. Mrs. Sen is perhaps too conscious of her identity as an Indian, more so as a Bengali. She fails to fit in the host American society. She has no company in America and is too aware of her loneliness, a stark contrast to her life in India. It may be assumed that she took to babysitting as a means of spending time and seeking company. She shares no American dream like her husband and is poles apart from the independent American women like Elliot's mother. As Elliot gradually learns, by home she always means India and mostly she survives on memories of Calcutta and, in, and the inadequacy of American life. And I quote over here, send pictures, they write, send pictures of your new life. What picture can I send? They think I live the life of a queen, Elliot. They think I press buttons and the house is clean. They think I live in a palace. According to Dr. Radesh Verma and Swayang Lamo, memory and sense of longing are acute in the first generation, thus their failure to belong to the host culture and the retention of the nativity. Mrs. Sen, as a first generation migrant, survives on the relics of her past life at Calcutta, drowning herself in nostalgia and alienating herself from the Western life. Mr. Sen, on the other hand, seems to be adjusting quite well to his life as an academic. It might be that the lack of professional involvement makes her life seem even more futile and empty. In comparing her with the other characters like Lilia's mother or Mala in The Third and Final Continent, she's lonely and extremely unhappy with herself. Mrs. Sen has no friends, no dreams, no place in America and is aware of the fact and is somewhere accepting it resigning herself to her fate. But Lilia in Mr. Pirzada Comes to Dine cannot afford to completely detach herself from the American lifestyle and peers, thus inhibiting her self-made cocoon. The distress... I'll come straight to the story. Lilia is a 10-year-old second-generation Indian-American who starts taking an avid interest in the land of her forefathers after she comes to know about the Bangladesh War of Independence owing to their guest, Mr. Pirzada, who comes to dinner every day with the intention of catching the latest news about his homeland. 
Lilia's parents ritualistic search for familiar surnames in the universe, university directory, by means of which they discover Mr. Pirzada, is yet another instance of how the first generation migrants strive to create a known territory in a foreign land, often collecting people with similar cultural backgrounds. The fact that, and I quote, the supermarket did not carry mustard oil, doctors did not make house calls, neighbors never dropped by without an invitation, bothered them, is typical of the older immigrants' nostalgic visits to their native lifestyles. Further, Lilia's initial mistake of identifying him as an Indian, exposing her ignorance about ethnic identities, disturbs her parents, and her father fears that Mr. Pirzada will take offense at it. Her mother, however, defends her. How can you possibly expect her to know about partition? For we live here now. She was born here. Lilia's father's disappointment at his daughter's lack of knowledge outside American history is to be pitted against her mother's acceptance and justification of the same. Lilia's father perceives her as the inheritor of their South Asian identities, while her mother, and I quote, gen seems genuinely proud of the fact as if it were a reflection of my character. For her, Lilia the American was assured a safe life, an easy life, a fine education, every opportunity. Far from the atrocities and inconveniences of the motherland, Lilia was protected and being trained for luxury and success. Later, we see how Lilia, who knew all about American history and geography, was reprimanded by her teacher when she tried to read a book on Pakistan from the school library. Is this book a part of your report, Lilia? No, Mrs. Kenyon. Then I see no reason to consult it. Do you? And I quote Tommy Sayers here. He says, Mrs. Kenyon's reprimand to Lilia for showing an interest in the world affairs shows the emphasis and precedence she gives to all things American and a distinction between American and the other. Moreover, the distinction is not neutral as Mrs. Kenyon shows a distaste for the other when she holds the book on Pakistan as if it were a hair clinging to my sweater. We also see Lilia celebrating Halloween and as she goes from house to house collecting candy, and I quote here, several people told me, they tell her that they have never seen an Indian witch before. Despite her costume and makeup, People could discern the Indian face and curiously, though she was born and bred American, she could hardly do away with her Indian identity. Robin E. Field writes, the physical and psychological distance from cultural forms that the second generation experiences precludes a complete identification with their roots. Concomitantly, the second generation often is not accepted as real Americans because of racial or ethnic differences from the white majority. So Lilia remains uh, the Indian witch, despite celebrating a Western festival. Though she does not lead a double life like Pirzada, one in Bangladesh signified by his pocket watch attuned to the local time in Dhaka, and the other in America signified by the watch on his wrist, she has started to realize that she has some very different interests from her American friend, and that American society certainly sees her as not one of their own. Therefore, and I quote again, the second generation exists in a liminal space of cultural borderlands, between the United States and their family's country of origin. The second generation is constantly negotiating their understanding of themselves, striving to balance, if not also integrate, their cultural roots and their American lifestyles. The first, and now I come to the conclusion, the first generation migrants like Mrs. Sen attempt to relive their native culture in the host country through a variety of performances like food, attire, rituals, language, literature, and art. The second generation can only live their cultural inheritance based on the narratives received from the parents. Therefore, their roots are merely the images created and indoctrinated by the parent figures, which mostly results in a feebler fondness for the native land. The first generation always longs for the mother country, looking for opportunities to return to or recreate the former cultural conditions. The second generation tries to assimilate themselves and live in conjunction with the host country culture and thereby become less alienated amongst their immediate peers. I quote, this generation, that is the second generation, will decide consciously and unconsciously which pieces of their cultural inheritance to incorporate into their lives as Americans, which parts to alter, and which practices to adopt. So we see Mrs. Sen adhering to her native customs in America, while Lilia choosing to celebrate Halloween, despite being marked as an Indian witch. Mrs. Sen clearly has failed to assimilate culturally. Her chaotic Calcutta homes is miles away. But the question is, will Lilia succeed? 
will Lilia, as a second generation immigrant with full knowledge of American life history and geography, cease to be less foreign than Mrs. Sen and finally be at home? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amrita, uh, you, for yes, for analyzing uh, in a very crisp manner about the first, second generation exiles, the concept of transnational diaspora, and how they are fluid, kind of, and how that sense of belonging, place, etc., whether it's uh, you know a home or whether it's a country, uh, or whether it's an idea of a country or a home. That's very interesting. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yes, we go on to the next speaker, who is Dinesh Kumar. Is uh, Mr. Dinesh Kumar ready? Yes, ma'am. I'm ready with my presentation. Yeah, sure. Am I audible, ma'am? Am I audible, ma'am? Ma yes, yes. You can start, sir. You're audible. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you, ma'am. And the topic of my discussion is the diasporic trajectories, the concept of belonging and homelessness in Amita Ghosh fiction. It goes without saying that Amita Ghosh occupies a prominent and towering place among the Indian writers in general and diasporic writers in particular. Without any shadow of doubt, diaspora is a psychological journey which is generally considered as a dilemma between homeland and new settlement nation. People who migrate from their own native place to some foreign land become stranger. Consequently, they suffer from the feeling of alienation and nostalgia, which inevitably affect the identity of a person, including peace and existential crisis. The concept of homeland and foreign land is the key element in Amita Ghosh's fictional world. In his novel, Ghosh has engaged uh, continuously in the risk of putting marginalized individuals back in the middle of the narrative and saving from getting lost in the hegemonic portrayal of the nation, especially concerned with the South Asian diaspora in the various regions of the world. It is an established fact that since the independence of India, the Indian diasporic writers set a new different uh, and new trend in the Indian literature. It is also a well-known fact that this term attracted the readers, the borders across the boundaries, irrespective of language, literary form, style, and techniques adopted in this ideology. Different perspectives, including diasporic literature, including magic realism, stream of consciousness technique, immigration, alienation, or adaptability of new lands and cultures. And last but not the least, nostalgia is one of the common traits that can be witnessed in the works of all the Indian writers as the Indian diaspora includes almost all parts of the world. It is a wide known fact that uh, a great deal of work in Indian writing in English are produced not uh, in the landscape of India, but uh, in widely distributed geographical areas of uh, indenture. In the present paper, the main focus will be on the few Indian diasporic writers and their work uh, which are worthy of detailed consideration. Without any shadow of doubt, the theory of diaspora with a number of aspects associated with it influenced considerably literature of every language of the world. Diasporic literature is, is also dubbed as an expatriate literature which earned international recognition and admiration in the last couple of decades. The literature of diaspora is very vast and expanded as well as an umbrella term that includes the works of uh, those authors outside their native country, which are clearly related to with the native culture and background. In this wide context, all those writers can be held as diasporic writers. It goes without saying that the diasporic works are deeply imbued with a sense of loss and alienation, which were the result of migration and expatriation. It is generally believed that alienation, displacement, nostalgia, a quest for identity and existential rootlessness are some of the key features of diasporic works which vividly explore the immigrant experience that comes out of the immigrant settlement of this connection. One of the notable critics, Uma Praneshwaran, has aptly defined it, I quote, in case of a migrant, whether the reason for it, for their migration may be financial 
social political no matter whether they are migrated for trade and commerce as religious preachers convicts soldiers as laborers as expatriates or refugees exiles or guest worker in search of betterment and opportunities have shared some common thing as well as differences based on their condition of migration and period of stay in the adopted lands unquote it is an established fact that amita ghosh is one of the leading and forerunner among the diasporic writers in india uh, writing in english and in his fictional and non fictional work ghosh displays a number of characters who straddle culture across border national culture as well as inhabit diverse spaces it is an established fact that amita ghosh character are the delineation of the unique predicament who was supposed to live and changed by historical forces beyond their control in his works no doubt the center concern are displacement migration and dislocation coupled with the loss of root rootedness experienced by uh, them and that problematizes the idea of similar identity the author's own a uh, peripatetic life largely contribute to the sustained treatment of this concept of identity in his fictional works in his books ghosh main concern has been the factor of migration and displacement and his individuals ranging from ordinary people or to king and rulers from colonized people to post colonial individual from pre modern slave to trader to modern contemporary workers experience the migration and dislocation in their lives displacement dislocation and identity are some of the key features of amita ghosh fiction this geographical and cultural dislocation affects to a large extent the concept of self the displacement of character from their native place to foreign lands because of various historical factors uh, including commerce trade and colonization undoubtedly it problematizes the rootedness of self but it can be witnessed that the author does not offer any one dimensional exploration of the concept of displacement as he is fully aware of multiple possibilities that engender as as well as one social location which is closely connected with some possible changes in one's attitude to life in displacement Amita Ghosh first novel The Circle of Reason deals with a number of lower middle class people fairly across the Indian Ocean towards uh, who goes you can say to Al Jazeera to earn their livelihood and it is a significant to note that Ghosh fictional world the concept of dislocation displacement largely contribute to affect the identity of the individual his fictional works investigate the idea how dislocation migration and displacement contribute uh, in you can say shaping the identity of the individual in a globalized world ghosh character had led from diverse socio cultural background who are the victim of this location they are and these located from their homeland to alien land by means of historical forces and voluntary exercise there are some people who are the victim of cultural fragmentation as well as those who migrate to better economic opportunity but in both the cases they try to relocate themselves in a new environment in the present work the author delineates beautifully the miserable and painful experiences of the migrants especially dislocated women <clears throat> these women says the author suffer from lack of economic resources that led to their exploitation the miserable plight of these uh, migrate uh, who migrates it problematizes the discourse of uh, globalization that looks upon migration as innocent way of being in the world ghosh another celebrated novel the glass palace uh, portrays beautifully the protagonist rajkumar who migrates to other pal- place burma in his teenage and he makes use of colonial machinery to consolidate his uh, a uh, enterprise and uh, the successful life of the character rajkumar in burma attest to his personal acumen shrewd intelligence and the novel displays the idea that when a person is dislocated establishes himself in an alien land he or she is supposed to experience hostility in the land of his or her uh, relocation in his work the hungry tide 
the author explores powerfully the same sense of being unwanted and unwelcomed through the pathetic flight of the refugees from east pakistan who try to relocate themselves in sundarban in bengal people who leave their native place and shift to some foreign land are generally treated as trespassers who are not uh, unfolded within the border of the nation or state in this way ghosh presents the concept of migration in multiple ways that stir pluralistic approach to the issue of migration and how this leads to the identity crisis among the individual who shift to alien lands this type of people who are displaced from their native land search for their identity on the basis of their relationship to the idea of home uh, at the center of uh, one of the central concern of amita ghosh's work is the question of identity that uh, is character search at unknown places the question of being rooted in some places is the central concern of uh, an individual in his work in most of diasporic works this is a static static idea of home seems to be challenged and replaced by a mobile variable idea at home that cannot be viewed pinned pinned down to only a particular boundary there is no doubt in denying the fact that one can come across this notion of home as well as the emotional impact associated with it that influences upon the migrant in both the diasporic and post colonial works an in depth and incisive study of the most prominent post colonial works and their title like an area of darkness a house for mr biswas by vs nalpal bombay dakalbi by farooq dongi brick lane by monika ali and an antique land and the glass palace by amita ghosh we will explore the idea of changing notion of home which is the recurrent feature of each and every work diasporic literature seeks to answer how people behave and act with their older identity associated with a geopolitical identity and they shift from their native land to a different socio cultural locality although desperate literature shows diasporic literature sh- share some feature with travel literature but it is entirely different from travel writing in the sense that it is quite contrary to travel and journey so diaspora is related with relocation settling to a new place as say clifford i quote diaspora involves dwelling maintaining community having collective homes away from home and in this it is different from exile with its frequently individualistic focus in the light of the above quoted views the diaspora diasporic writers be a close relation with the host country and one's nation interaction between one's root and roots in diasporic writing the displacement and dislocation that is accompanied by the sense of loss and desire for a return back to home country destabilizes the root rooted sense of identity as we find one of the recurrent features of diaspora that it is just the settling down to a new place striving roots elsewhere one can notice complex and multidimensional negotiation in one's affiliation to the cultural of one's original and host country in diasporic writing in general and the idea of homeland is considered to be the central concern as avatar bara in this connection says i quote Uh, it suggests that uh, characterized diasporic imagination is not a longing for a return to homeland, but a homing desire. Unquote. Where is home? On the other hand, home is a mythic place of desire in the diasporic imagination. In this sense, it is a place of no return, even if it is possible to visit the geographical territory that is seen as a place of origin. On the other hand, home is also the lived experience of a uh, locality it sounds uh, and smells its heat and dust balmy summer evening and uh, excitement of the first snow snowfall shivering winter evening sober gray skies in the middle of the day all this as medi- mediated by the historical specific everyday of uh, social relations in the light of the above statement we can also uh, uh, can say 
take into consideration the works of Salman Rushdie, who deals with the concept of diasporic uh, imagination to the imaginary homeland. And the writer's victim of nostalgia created created by past try to reclaim sense of self as understood in their home do not create actual native place but only imaginary homeland like Rishdi. Omi Ke Baba also find displacement and dislocation as productive condition and reject the idea of a fixed and rooted identity. In his famous work, The Location of the Culture, the author emphasizes on rethinking the conviction of identity as one finds in national discourse. He opines the necessity of border not as rigid uh, democrations separating spaces completely, but only the but only as threshold in between spaces that create scope for reformulation of identity. In other words, as Baba also says about these uh, the hybrid consist uh, spaces. I quote, the need to think beyond narrative of uh, 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 originary and uh, initial subjectiv subjectivities and to focus on those moment uh, or processes that are produced in the articulation of uh, cultural differences. And uh, there in between spaces provide the terrain for elaborating strategy of selfhood, singular or communal that initiate new sign of identity and innovation, innovative sites of collaboration and uh, also in the act of defining the idea of society itself. Uh, in Amitav Ghosh, two separate, we can say, trilogy written, a sea of poppies and the river of smoke, we find the possibility of formation of identity in, in on the basis of new affiliation and relationship when people move away from their native lands. The first part focuses on how displacement from the familiar space can help people to find new identity. The roots symbolic of sailing away and the roots can offer new vistas of uh, developing an identity. The passengers belonging to different social cultural background come up with their own cultural ethos having their different identity based on various factors, including caste, creed, and social status. The author portrays the journey across the Indian Ocean offer the scope for re, uh, renegotiation with their identities. In other terms, people totally unaware of their social cultural affiliation try to negotiate their identity in a new land. People who are dislocated, their dislocation uh, is also a great help to find out their identity governed by shared experiences as well as common sense of fate. Thus, the displacement of all new ways of negotiating with one's identity. One can no longer stick to identity one possesses, but the new condition may modify the way one is looked at by others. This is most clearly evident in the case of socially disempowered people who are not well accepted in their country of adoption or migration. Amitav Ghosh explored this multidimensionality in his works which fictionalize the myriad ways people negotiate their identity. Amitav Ghosh, however, distances himself from offering any definite model of identity formation because he represents the possible changes in the way one can make a sense of oneself in a different ambience. While displacement sometimes helps people to become aware of their multiple affiliation, it may also force them to stick to their particular identity in the face of dominant discourse. Thus they get involved in identity politics and do not do not appreciate the inadequacy of the markers of social identity. That was all about my paper. Uh, have you finished? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. I have. Yeah, I have finished, ma'am. It okay. is completed. Thank you so much. Uh, we will take questions at the end. Uh, we now go on to uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Sumi Manzoor. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Somi Manzoor, uh, and the title of my paper is <coughs> um, 
Hegemony and Identity Crisis in the novel The Reluctant Fundamentalist by Mohsin Hamid. Uh, the word hegemony was first used by Xenophon and Euphorus, the Greek historians. So it was there before Greek civilization, but at the time it was used in a different sense. It meant rule, authority, and political dominance of a leader. From 15th century, many hegemonic powers have tried to give their own interpretation of the word hegemony. In the 19th century, Antonio Gramsci explained this concept of hegemony in his book, Notes on the Southern Question in 1926. He says, the term hegemony, <coughs> uh, um, the term hegemony in Gramsci itself has two faces. On the one hand, it is contrasted with domination and as such bound, by, bound up with the opposition state civil society. And on the other hand, hegemonic is some, sometimes used as an opposite of corporate or economic corporate to designate an um, historical phase in which a given group moves beyond a position of corporate existence and defense of its economic position and aspires to a position of leadership in the political and social arena. Uh, the one group the hegemon leads the position and dominates the other. The superior group makes them feel <coughs> a need of their presence. The group they want to dominate feel they don't exist without them. The inferior or subordinate group is shown newer opportunities and new possibilities, and they let them rule with their own consent. The working class population uh, have themselves formed an alliance that surrendered to the hegemonic power of the ruling bourgeois. Thus, they have succeeded in gaining the consent of the bro broad peasant mass. Mufi says, um, I quote, the proletariat can become the leading and the dominant class to the extent that it succeeds in creating a system of aliens which al allows it to mobilize the majority of the working population against capitalism and the bourgeois state. The subordinates or the poor class are subjugated because of the economic cause. They are not capable to reach the level of the ruling class economically. So they are subjugated and oppressed. They themselves feel they themselves feel them to be superior and let them do what they want. The French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser in his essay, Contradiction and Overdetermination, discusses hegemony and ideology. Ideology denotes the imaginary relationship between individuals and the real things. Ideology is not the reality, it's the facade which hides the reality or truth from the individuals, which is established by the dominant class and which is to be followed by subor subordinate class. They make it the reality for them. <clears throat> then in his book, uh, Ideology and State Apparatus, Louis Althusser sa says about hegemony. <clears throat> the class in power cannot lay down the laws in the uh, ISAs, as easily as it can in the state apparatus, not only because the former ruling class are able to retain strong positions there for a long time, but also because the resistance of the exploited class is able to find means and occasions to express itself there, either by the utilizations of their contradictions or by conquering combat position in struggle. The subordinate group uh, cannot resist or revolt against the hegemon as it's morally subjugated by it. Their minds are subjugated. It's the hegemony control of the dominant class or the institution of civil society, education, work, family, leisure, etc., within the outer defenses of the repressive state apparatus that makes the revolutionary transformation so difficult. The ruling class becomes the emphasizer for the lower class or the civil society, but in reality, it's their enemy and they are unaware about it. The people on whom the hegemony is put, they <clears throat> get affected through many ways. They get used to it and live their life as it is and don't want to change it. Some people get alienated from their realities. Some people feel identity crisis. They get dissuaded from their lives and leave their present life to start over a new one. They get disillusioned and feel isolated. These are the influences which hegemony brings upon people. The identity of Pakistanis is more endangered in post 9-11 situation than it was ever before. 9-11 transformed the image of the Muslim world into fundamentalists and terrorists forever. In the novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, uh, the protagonist, namely Changiz, goes through the hegemonic domination of American ideology after the 9-11. The war on terror was announced and the Pakistani immigrants living in America felt loss of identity and left America for Pakistan. 
In the beginning of the novel, um, Cengiz is happy as he lives in America. He is a lover of American ideology towards em immigrants. Uh, and he says, in the beginning of the novel, students like me were given visas and scholarships, complete financial aid, mind you, and invited into the ranks of the meritocracy. In return, we, expect, we were expected to contribute our talents to our society, the society we were joining, and for the most part, we were happy to do so. I certainly was, at least at first. Cengiz being one of them, he was proud with his American identity, but after 9-11, he realized his worth and real worth and his real identity as it as to where he belonged as he was a Muslim immigrant in America. This is how American ideology works. They choose best candidates candidates for their own benefit as they use their talents. Hamid also shows the naked truth about Cengiz's reaction towards the attack. When he saw the World Trade Center fall, um, Cengiz, uh, um, Hamid uh, say that, and then um, it's the words. These are the words of the Cengiz. And then I smiled. Yes, despicable as it may sound, my initial reaction was to be to be remarkably pleased. Mahmoud uh, Mamdani, in his book "Good Muslim, Bad Muslim: America, the Cold War, and the Roots of Terror," writes that. Um, after 9-11, President Bush moved to distinguish between good Muslims and bad Muslims. Bad Muslims were uh, clearly responsible for terrorism. At the same time, the president seems to assure Americans that good Muslims would undoubtedly support us in a war against them. But unless proved to be good, every Muslim was presumed to be bad. Cengiz's position in America changed after the announcement of war on terror by the British government. Um, Bush government. All the Muslim immigrants were disillusioned and disheartened. This was, a, was the American hegemonic power as they propounded their own notions about the happenings and didn't listen to the voices of others. They familiarized the word Islamophobia, wherein the Muslims were taken as miscreants and were not trustworthy. Before 9-11, Cengiz was considered <coughs> Cengiz considered America as his own home, but after 9-11, he felt change around him. Muslims were seen with suspicious eyes. He was shocked and could not stand this. He felt himself as an outsider. When 9-11 happened, he was in Manila. When he returned back to New York, at airport, he was sing singled out and was separated from his colleagues. They joined the queue of America. And he says, they joined the queue of America, American citizens, and I joined one of one for foreigners. He was asked the purpose of his visit here, and he said, I live here. But they didn't want to hear that answer from him. He reached Ma Manhattan lonely, as his colleagues had already left him. Cengiz went to Lahore for some time, and after coming back, he didn't shave his beard, as it was a sign of protest from him. He wanted his identity to be seen by everybody. He was abused by some strangers because of his beard, and at Andrew Samson, he became a subject of whispers and stares. The same people treated him well before, but now they hesitate to even talk to him. He says, I had not shaved my two-week-old beard. It was perhaps a form of protest on my part, a symbol of my identity, or perhaps I sought to remind myself of the reality I had just left behind. I do not now recall my precise motivations. I know only that I did not wish to blend in with the army of clean-shaven youngsters who were my co-workers, and that inside me, for multiple reasons, I was deeply angry. Cengiz was... Cengiz became more conscious of his position in America when he went to Kyle for assessing the value of a non-profitable company. Its chief operating officer was an old man, jo John Bautista, who <coughs> tells him about the Janissaries. Uh, and he says they were Christian boys, he explained, captured by the Ottoman and trained to be soldiers in a Muslim army. At that time, the greatest army in the world. They were ferocious and utterly loyal. They had fought to erase their own civilizations. They had nothing else to turn to. It actually symbolized Cengiz's own condition as he himself was a modern-day Janissary as he left his own country to work here in America for his own bright future. But America in turn left him alienated and disillusioned. He is a servant of the American empire at a time when it was invading a country with kinship to mine. I reflect, and he says, I reflected that I had always resented the manner in which America conducted itself in the world. 
your country's constant interference in the affairs of others was insufferable. Insufferable. Vietnam, Korea, the Straits of Taiwan, the Middle East, now Afghanistan, in each of the major conflicts and standoff, standoffs that ringed my mother continent of Asia. America played a central role. Their finance was a primary means by which the American empire exercised its power. It was right for me to refuse to participate any longer in facilitating this project of domination. The only surprise, surprise was that I had required so much time to arrive at my decision. Uh, to conclude, America has uh, been the central figure in the world affairs. It's the world's greatest hegemonic power, which tries to control the nations according to its own whims and notions. It makes great policies for its own benefit. Genghis, after feeling himself to be an outsider, leaves for Pakistan and there becomes a lecturer in the university and teaches his own experience <coughs> and American ideology to his students. Um, um, uh, that's all. Thank you, everybody. Is that all? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you had uh, very beautifully explained how, you know, communities are branded. They are kind of stereotyped due to their, you know, yes, their social, cultural, and religious identities. And you mentioned the uh, 11 Yeah, that uh, changed the structure of uh, the cultural thinking. I should say. Yes, ma'am. Uh, especially for the minorities, uh, and uh, it did a lot more to the world because earlier, when uh, you know communities used to move across diaspora, uh, they were recognized as ethnic, ethno-religious communities. But uh, you know, after that, the dimensions of uh, looking at Muslims changed entirely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. I think we have thank one you. more. Uh, thank you left. Uh, Ikra Manzoor, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, so you can begin with your paper. Uh, okay, ma'am. Yeah. Hello, everyone. The, my name is Ikra Manzoor. I am a research scholar at DABV Indore. The title of my research paper is Homelessness and Belongingness, a study of the lowland and the namesake. This research article examines the selected novels, the lowland and the namesake to manifest that home is not only located in place, but can also be associated with people. And when people lose this home and sense of belonging, they suffer psychological trauma and struggle to find it again. Homelessness does not simply mean a lack of home or lack of roof over your head or an availability of physical space, which meets your needs and provides space to maintain privacy and interpersonal relationships. It means a lack of sense of security, belongingness, rootedness, identity, physical, emotional, mental security, availed by a person or place. Homelessness is not only the result of migration, but is also caused by some traumatic life event. Homelessness causes psychological trauma in a person who loses home, located either in person or place, causes his social exclusion or invokes a sense of exile in him or her. His, this, loss of, this loss, which may be either in terms of person or place, makes a person physical, emotional, and mental nomad. This nomadic venture into abyss leads to an unending struggle of accumulation of new home. This assertion of new home provides a sense of belonging and meaning to the life of a person who had been rendered homeless earlier and was in search of a new, in search of a new home. Gori's sense of home is associated with her husband Odeyan. Udayan uh, provides, uh, provides her with a sense of home and belongingness. In order to acquire this, um, this home, she elopes with him, marries him, <clears throat> marries him and joins his uh, fa family, putting, um, uh, putting all her uncles, aunts, relatives behind her. She not only lives the life of a new housewife, but also contributes to revolutionary Naxalite movement with him. To be with Udayana, that is to possess the sense of belonging and home, she bears the burden of household work, responsibility of being a wife, 
along with her studies gori watches the killing of adeyana which is uh, who is um the active member of naxalite movement from the terrace of her in-laws house in the fields by paramilitary forces watching the death of udayana dilutes the sense of home and belongingness in gori gori who is expecting um, udayan's child accepts the marriage proposal of her brother in law subhash because she wants to leave lowland where she has lost her only home and wants to leave behind everything that reminds her of her loss gori migrates to rohed island to join subhash she works hard on her books in library where she is only gori not wife of subhash gori suffers from the trauma of losing home even in her dreams as subhash hears i hear i quote the sound of scream stuffled by clenched jaws a, cl- a closer mouth and quote of gori when he avenged he is sleeping in the drawing room subhash's physical features and his voice reminds gori of odayan which in turn reminds her of her lost home therefore she is neither able to find home in her second husband nor in her daughter bela after her birth here i quote what she had seen from the terrace the evening the police came to adeyan now formed a hole in her vision gori um, uh, unquote gori uh, admits herself in phd program and invests all her um, all her time in it this um, Uh, disting, uh, distancing herself from Bela and Subhash, so, uh, slowly she develops a new sense of home and belonging in her studies. When Bela is twelve, she leaves her and migrates to California in order to pursue an um, pursue pursue an academic career as a professor of philosophy. Finally, she finds her lost sense of home in her studies, her academic career, her profession as a professor of philosophy. in the novel um, in the novel the lowland bela bela's sense of home is located in her mother gori and her father husband and her father subhash she loves them equally and shares her home with them in rohed island although bela's relationship with gori is based on compromising terms bela still loves her gori shuts the door of her room on bela while focusing on her phd and she lets bela to be on her own when she is in her third grade when bela is 12 year old gori migrates to california and leaves Be- bela and subhash behind and is destroying bela's sense of home security safety which is partly associated with gori and partly with subhash because of this lost sense of home and belongingness bela becomes emotionally vulnerable and takes an abode aloof from her school and mates and her father here i quote she spoke she spoke to him only when necessary certain days she did not spoke to uh, speak to him at all unquote she loses appetite restricts herself to her home and to her house and to her room and gets disinterested in her studies and school activities she loses um, this loss of home affect her psyche her life and her social behavior after overcoming her trauma um, her trauma related to her lost sense of home um, and belongingness with the help of psychologist she once again becomes socially active participates in various social activities Uh, assignments and um, projects in school improves her grades and uh, her appetite returns she majors in environmental science and instead of joining a university like both her parents her discomfort with rohed island and her subconscious desire to acquire a new sense of home and belongingness um, actuates her to take a nomadic path she takes agriculture as her profession which compels her to take jobs across the state in accordance with the crop seasons although bela has received has recovered from the shock of lost home represented by her represented by the loss of her mother but this loss becomes the most basic awareness of her life due to which she is unable to settle at one place almost for a decade and is unable to develop an intimate relationship in any of her love affairs this loss of home in the form of her mother has become a perennial part of her existence when she gets pregnant in one of her relationship she gives birth to megna bela finds a new sense of home in her daughter motherhood filled the space left in her existence due to the loss of her first home 
Bela's new sense of home and belongingness now becomes located in her love for her daughter, her fondness for her lover Drew, and her love her love for her father. Bela settles in Rohit's island and renews her association with the city only when she finds a new sense of home, a new sense of home after Meghna's birth. In the novel, the namesake Ashma migrates to a totally alien land, alien land, uh, to accompany Ashok after marrying him, and loses her home where she has spent nineteen years with her family to America, where she begins her life with a stranger. Ashma, um, uh, Ashma uh, is just a minute. Just a minute. Mm, uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Um, um, Ashima misses her home located. Um, Ashima misses her home located in distant land, India. Not only with regard to its culture, custom, food, social practices, but also, um, but also, uh, company, community. It has offered in terms of family, friends. Relatives and neighbors. Nevertheless, when she is admitted to the hospital for her first delivery, she knows that she is not supposed to talk to the woman on the other side of curtains because of the privacy norms followed by the American people. When uh, Ashima is um, when Ashima is offered food in hospital, she is instructed by her nurse not to eat chicken. Um, uh, here I quote: Ashima would not have touched the chicken even if permitted. Even if permitted, um, uh, even if permitted, uh, Ashima eat um, uh, Americans eat their chicken in its skin. However, Bengalis um, do not eat chicken with it is with uh, with it is, uh, do not cook chicken with it is skin. All these cultural differences inculcate sense of loneliness, alienation, fear of other in her, and enhances her lost sense of home. Over years, Ashma develops a sense of belongingness with America by adjusting in it. By adjusting in it, she uh, accepts its cultural norms, festivals, social norms, learns its language, learns its language. Ashma learns to celebrate uh, Christmas, Easter, to drive to be to drive to be on her own. She accepts the food habits of her children and freedom provided to her children by the Western culture. After thirty years of being in America, she realizes that home is not located in place but in people. Therefore, she decides to sell her home, sell her house on. Pemberton Road, and to spend six months in India with her brother and his family, and six months in America with her children and her friends. In the novel, the Lowland Mosumi. In the novel, um, in the novel, the namesake Mosumi develops a sense of belongingness um, and um, finds a home in Graham, with whom she has fallen in love and gets engaged. She leaves the city she loved, um, that is Paris, to be with Graham, rents an apartment with him on York Avenue, and becomes a doctoral candidate in French literature in NYU, New York. However, Mosumi. However, Mosumi uh, ends up having a breakup with um, breakup with Graham. Mosumi thus loses her first home located in Graham. After the break after the breakup, Graham moves um, out of their shared apartment. This loss of home fills her with distress and anxiety. And I here I quote: She swallows half a bottle of pills. Um, uh, was forced to drink alcohol. Uh, was forced to drink charcoal in an in an emergency room. Unquote. Masumi has a nervous breakdown. She leaves the apartment she shared with Graham as she cannot afford it alone. She refuses to go back home and stays with some friends in Brooklyn. This loss of home is very painful. In uh, is very painful to her. So she becomes weaker and thinner. It takes her some time to heal and to be on her own. Slowly, she re recovers, um, moves out of her friend's house, goes um, on movies alone, um, uh, and throws herself into her studies, catching up all the work she had abandoned that spring because of her break because of her breakdown. 
after years of break um after a year of her breakup she dates google falls in love with him and marries him tries to find her lost sense lost sense of home and belongingness in him soon after their marriage musumi realizes that google is not the home she is seeking so she ends up having an affair with dimitri her old acquaintance um, with um, when google comes to know about her affair she de uh, de divorces him and um, shifts back uh, from uh, america to paris in search um, in search of belongingness and a home to conclude after losing their first home gori bela ashima masumi all suffer anxiety psychological trauma um, psychological and psychological trauma loss of home disables gori emotionally due to which she feels as a mother and as a wife unhappiness between her parents became the basic awareness of bela's life and she loses trust in the institution of marriage and fails to form a close association with with any of her love uh, love partners nearly for two decades ashma suffers um, from alienation ruthlessness um, loneliness and anxiety musumi feels as a wife this loss of home and belongingness necessitates them to uh, to uh, to search for a new home and belongingness as it is the prerequisite of human existence gori's um, lifelong struggle with her academics um, provides her the home she longed for love of her father daughter Uh, and drew avails bela her lost sense of home and belongingness ashma creates her home in um, in her family in kolkata and in america masumi continuously remains in search of home that's all from my side thank you yes thank you ikra uh, thank you you uh, very succinctly you know summed it up and how uh, personal problems and personal disasters and tragedies they kind of mix with this idea of the diaspora and they bring uh, you know traumatic results for the protagonist uh, all of you all have concentrated on the diaspora and i was wondering you see uh, this is just an observation that uh, you know uh, the concept of the diaspora as ian chambers or maybe paul gilroy in his the black atlantic says is different when we you know think about the asian diaspora because uh, then it is not only a country it is a space like what uh, you know arjun apudurai calls ethno spaces because you know it's a space in the mind rather than uh, you know a physical space sometimes diaspora is that all right it's not always a physical space and uh, most of you all i think you all have gone through but you can look up the rutledge diaspora studies reader and there is another book which is coming to mind it is by uh, it is by nasrullah uh, mumbral or something like that which is uh, a little bit of theory on the diaspora i think you get that over the internet so just uh, you know you can read it up Uh, now we can invite questions uh, if there are any for the presenters are there any questions from the audience yes we can take those up for the for the participants i mean uh, for the presenters yes are there any questions are the hosts uh, there i think uh, they can take up the questions and uh, the participants i mean the presenters would answer them are there any questions am i audible yes yes ma'am yes ma'am you are perfectly audible yes because uh, uh there if there are any questions i think uh, all the paper presenters are here they can answer them If there no, are any, no, ma'am, I'm good from my end. No questions from my end, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, uh, there are no questions. So, uh, thank you so much, each of the uh, paper presenters, and thank you, uh, the base uh, organization, for arranging such a wonderful. Uh, you know, it's a very pertinent topic of the hour because, you know, countries, people, and even communities are getting displaced. Now we are having community diasporas where. uh you know it's a kind of institutionalized uh malpractice to drive out ethnic communities and to close eyes with regard to their identity to kind of obliterate them uh, which is what is more painful 
you know, obliterate them and obliterate their identities, their contributions. And uh, I think this is something where uh, it's not only about home and homelessness, it's about the ontological search and recognition, not only the ontological, uh, ontological search, but also the ontological necessity of recognition that we come across in diasporic studies. So thank you, everybody. I think uh, the host can conclude uh, the session. Um, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for chairing the session. And uh, uh, thank you all the paper presenters. Have we come to uh, the end of the, the we might papers. call it a day? Um, now, yeah. before we conclude, I would uh, like to uh, invite and I would request Professor Moshed Alam, sir, to please deliver the formal vote of thanks for the day. Uh, Mushedha, are you there? Yes, Jahira. Uh, yes. So this is over to you, Mushida. Yeah, thank you, Jahira. Um, thank you. So uh, we had a uh, wonderful session, I would say. Uh, and I enjoyed the session thoroughly. Uh, although the papers were, you know, based on analysis of uh, the writings by diaspora writers from India and Pakistan, but they were uh, theoretically very, very sound. and they captured very well, you know, the theme of the seminar uh, that tries to understand the question of belonging and homelessness. So I congratulate the five presenters uh, and I thank them for joining uh, our, you know, for joining us from different parts of the country. So I thank uh, Dr. S. Sujaritha, who joined us from Pondicherry University Community College. Uh, I thank Amrita Mitra, who joined us from Banwari Lal Bhalotia College, uh, Asansol. I also thank uh, Mr. Dinesh Kumar, who joined us from Dayal Singh College. Uh, and I also thank uh, Somi Manjur and Ikra Manjur, uh, who joined us from lovely professional university and DA Vishavidyalai, respectively. Uh, I hope that uh, you would join us later on in, you know, uh, in another you know, seminar or in, a, in another conference. Uh, and uh, let me take the opportunity to thank our uh, chair, Dr. Pinky Isha, uh, who is from Ravindra Bharati University. So thank you, madam, for chairing the session and for those insightful observations that you made at the end of the uh, session. So. Uh, thank you again uh, from BASE and from Ambedkar Center for Social and Cultural Studies, Gore College, as well as from uh, B.R. Ambedkar College, Nadia. Uh, we hope to learn from you again. And so we hope that we will have you again with us, maybe not as a chair, uh, but as a you know speaker. So... That's yeah, I would love to. Here. I would love to speak on, uh, you know, any topic or any seminar next uh, that would come up from your end. Thank you so much. Yeah, that would be wonderful, madam. Thank you. So here we conclude the session. Uh, thank you all once again for joining us. Jahira. Oh uh, yes, uh, Mushad, actually. Um... Now, who is going to take care of the recording? Hassan, are you there? Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, so the, yes. Uh, so, thank you, Mushreddha, once again. And thank you, uh, Pinky Isha, ma'am, and all the paper presenters, once again. Uh, so, we are concluding for the day. And tomorrow, we have uh, our next plenary sessions. Uh, the schedule uh, is already with all of you. We have shared the schedule. So please join us tomorrow for the last day of the conference. Uh, good night, all of you, and uh, please take care. Thank you so much. Yes, good night, good night. Good night.